tons of connections here. Um, I'm a big jazz fan, and I'm giving a talk in a jazz club, you know, so it's unusual for me, first time ever. And I also went to Wits and dropped out of Wits, so it's nice to be so close by. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be talking about the land issue, and my theme is complexity on the one hand and simplifications of policy on the other. I'm going to be talking about six, a six-sided figure, six aspects of the land question, uh, and how they combine in complicated ways. I'll be talking about production, ecology, property, power, institutions, and identity. And these interpenetrate with each other and combine in a myriad of ways, creating a seemingly unmanageable degree of complexity and generating profound challenges for policy frameworks. So, right now is a crucial moment in our history. Failing land policies appear to have placed us on the edge of a very steep cliff. Not on its own, of course, because there are many other factors at work, including state capture, but the prospect of expropriating property rights with little or no compensation has sent a shiver of fear down the spines of many a South African. Of course, mostly privileged, mostly white, but not only, many other people as well. And actually, this is, I think, a moment of great danger uh, if we get land policies wrong. We're giving, uh, giving a lot of talks to investors from this country and overseas, and they're all terrified of property rights being rendered insecure. And a big disinvestment is not entirely unimaginable. But it's also a moment of opportunity to begin to address for the first time, really, in a, re a, a truly serious way, the land question. So what is the land question? What is the land? Land signifies many different things to different people at different times. And, of course, land reform is an important component of the post-apartheid settlement in its own right, and it does require well-designed policies and programs aimed at creating a just and equitable pattern of land ownership and wealth in our country. To that extent, the EFF is correct. But land is also a powerful symbol of the failures of the post-apartheid settlement period more generally, most notably in relation to employment, asset ownership and income. Some reminders, unemployment levels, 27% or 37%, if we use the expanded definition, these are extraordinarily high. 55% for youth. Many young people in this country are never going to have a job in their lives. As a result, they don't feel a great... They're not invested very much in the system as it is. Pull it down and start all over again. The Gini coefficient, which is a way of measuring inequality for income, is around 0.65. But for assets, for wealth, it's 0.95. That's close to one, which is absolute inequality. These are extraordinarily deep levels of poverty and inequality in our country. And they surely indicate a state of affairs that is not sustainable and is now beginning to provoke the rise of destructive forms of populism. Populism isn't all bad, but the versions which we are seeing being put on the table are potentially highly destructive. They could sink our vulnerable economy. These kinds of politics involve simplistic forms of reasoning, immune to rational argument, and are potentially disastrous. The entire debate around expropriation without compensation, for example, is founded on gross misunderstandings of cause and effect. For the EFF and others, including some in the ruling party perhaps, the failures of land reform are seen as a result of one key failing. The Constitution does not allow for the taking back the expropriation of the stolen land, since it requires payment of market-based compensation, although that's not strictly true, and this the government cannot afford. Hence, land reform fails. One simple cause, one large effect. Similarly, amending the Constitution to allow con confiscation or expropriation without compensation and land reform will soon begin to succeed. Again, one simple cause and one large anticipated effect. But both these arguments, these propositions, are demonstrably false, in fact. Firstly, constitutional lawyers agree that the Constitution already allows for uh, expropriation without compensation in some cases. If the criterion laid out very clearly in the, in the Constitution that compensation 
that is paid must be just and equitable. And a string of conditions and criteria are outlined very clearly in Section 25 of the Constitution. But secondly, and more importantly, all the evidence suggests that there are many other reasons for the, for the failure of land reform. Firstly, a tiny budget, 0.4 to never more than 1% of the total, weak state capacity, corruption, and poor political leadership. These can in turn be traced to lack of sufficient political will on the part of the ruling party. And over the past nine years, political will been focused on elite enrichment rather than public interest. In addition, the land policies adopted over the past nine years since Zuma came to power are inappropriate, badly designed, and poorly implemented. These include the proactive land acquisition strategy and its sister policy on state ownership and leasehold rights to land required for redistribution, which means that black South Africans who get land through land reform are not allowed to become owners. Ironically, this policy was adopted in 1913, 100 years after, so in 2013, 100 years after the 1913 Land Act, which also prevented black South Africans from holding land across the majority of the country. Um, but also the, the ill-fated rural development policy, the so-called 50-50 policy, the agri parks program, and policies on communal land tenure and governance that are heavily biased in favor of unaccountable traditional leaders. These are bad policies. And over the last nine years, implementation has basically gone for a loop. Amending the Constitution will do nothing to address these real causes of failure. Political will, building capacity, eliminating corruption, increasing the budget, reviewing policies, and sound implementation are what, is, are, what are needed. Sounds easy, right? In fact, developing appropriate land policy is not quite so simple. And agreeing on a minor clarificatory amendment to the Constitution might in fact be a good idea. It will help get us, move us forward so we can get to focus on the real tasks. Land questions in contemporary South Africa are both inherently political and multidimensional in scope. They involve questions, as I said, of production, ecology, property, power, institutions, and identity across the urban-rural divide. These six dimensions, analogous perhaps to the six uh, sides of Rubik's Cube, combine with each other in a variety of ways. The potential for failure and unintended consequence is high if complexity is not well understood and not factored into policy. But complexity can also be disabling, and policies require straightforward diagnoses and prescriptions that can be turned into practical programs implemented by ordinary bureaucrats, cutting through the Gordian knot rather than struggling to untie it one strand at a time. Complexity is potentially disempowering, and brutal, simpli brutal simplification sometimes seems the only practical response. On the other hand, not acknowledging and understanding complexity seems only to increase the probability of fundamentally flawed interventions being made with consequences the very opposite of what we intend. So we need a path between these two extremes of blind action on the one hand and enlightened passivity on the other. So let me get into my six themes. I'm showing a series of images here which suggest that there are in the imagination around land, we live with some very simple binaries, either ors, this option or that option. And I'm going to explore these disabling binaries uh, in a variety of contexts. Most of them show, on the one hand, an image of the world that some people would like us to believe is, is the right way to see the world. It's basically a formal sector, commercial, modernized model of the world. Many of the other pictures show a very different reality experienced by most rural South Africans. And most of these images here are taken from the area that I work in, in rural KwaZulu-Natal, in a place called Msinga. Okay, just to give you some context. So what about production? This is a key part of the jigsaw puzzle. Most, much of South Africa is arid or semi-arid, with only 28% of the land surface receiving 600 millimeters or more of rainfall per annum. Most land is suitable only for extensive livestock production or wildlife. Only 13.7% of our land area is potentially arable, that is, can grow crops. Another 10% of arable land is irrigable, and you need water to grow certain kinds of crops. These severe agroecological constraints are rarely discussed in the current debates that we're having. 
where high levels of inequality in land holdings are associated with deep rural poverty, as in South Africa, the redistribution of land is in fact urgent in order to address this burning land question. But also, I would argue, to make a contribution, contribution to addressing poverty and inequality by enhancing rural income. But there is a major challenge. How will the large and growing urban population be fed? And what kinds of farming systems can produce the necessary surplus to feed people in the cities and to earn export earnings? Implicit in this way of posing the question is a view of agriculture that is widely held, involving a stark binary of productive, large-scale commercial farming on the one hand and semi-subsistence, small-scale farming on the other. Both of these are, in fact, stereotypes. The dominant view in South Africa is that only commercial farming is truly productive and must be retained, but that the land reform must, be opened, must open up the sector for black farmers. The mirror opposite of this view, one that is much less influential, sees smallholder farmers as more efficient than large-scale uh, producers, mainly because of their labor intensity, with an inverse relationship, this is, this is what the economists call it, between efficiency and scale. This view is widely held in other parts of the world, but not in South Africa. Land activists then argue that large-scale land redistribution to the rural poor is a key solution to rural poverty. So positions on this debate tend to be highly polarized, and there's little discussion of trade-offs, combined options, or multiple pathways of change. But between these two poles lies a middle ground. So what I argue is that the agricultural sector is firstly highly concentrated, with fewer than 30,000 farm units in existence, that is commercial farms, and the proportion of total turnover produced by the top 20% of farmers is likely to be as high as 80%. So a relatively small number of farmers, less than 5,000, produce most of the food and other products in our, from the agricultural sector <coughs> in South Africa. So I then suggest that the target for land redistribution should be 60 to 70% of farmland, leaving the top 20% of producers alone for another two decades in order to provide some certainty and security with regard to food supply and export earnings while we proceed with a radical large-scale land redistribution on the other 70 to 80%. Who should be the, the recipients of the re redistributed land? The most obvious contenders are not the rural poor, in fact, not the poorest of the poor, but rather, I would argue, the 200 to 250,000 market-oriented smallholder farmers who already exist against all the odds and produce crops and livestock for sale. People in this category, I believe, have the potential to grow to become successful commercial producers with access to more land, uh, better land and water, plus well-designed support programs and more labor-intensive enterprises. So that's my argument, and I present it at many gatherings in our sector. In my view, this, the employment creation of this middle road has the potential to create as many as 1.2 million new jobs. If another 200,000 of hectares can be brought under ir irrigation, and half of that is made available to smallholders. A small but a significant contribution to reducing these massive levels of unemployment in our country. These binaries then of modern versus traditional farming systems, large versus small scale, capitalists versus peasants, whatever you want to call them, I suggest are misleading and unhelpful. They obscure the existence of these market-oriented smallholders who at the moment are receiving little or no support from government and few of whom are receiving land through land reform. They're invisible to the policymakers. But there are only 5,000 black commercial farmers in the country at, at best, probably more like 3,000. And the prospects for growing their numbers rapidly enough through land redistribution are very weak, very poor, given how capital-intensive and how competitive commercial farming today is. Yet, if rural land is not redistributed to black South Africans on a large scale and relatively quickly, the land question will remain a gift that keeps on giving to populist politicians and will help to secure their support amongst growing numbers of unemployed young people. 2019, the next election, the one after that, 2025. 
Who are young people going to vote for unless we see real change? That's my challenge. It's a numbers question. Okay, that's the, the longest uh, uh, discussion of, of these aspects in my paper. I turn now to ecology. Okay, the ecological sustainability of current food production methods is another source of controversy. Land reform policies that might result in the spread of communal areas, as they called, across former white South Africa, are feared and vilified by the large-scale commercial farming lobby. In their view, communal tenure systems are inevitably uh, generate what's called a tragedy of the commons through overgrazing and over, uh, overstocking. These farmers, these, this lobby portrays the former reserves as ecological deserts and implicitly affirm themselves, private landowners, as the true custodians of nature. There's another view, the, the polar opposite. Advocates of small-scale farming and land redistribution respond to this by citing research on what are called non-equilibrium ecosystem dynamics in arid and semi-arid zones and the possibility that high stocking rates in these areas are in fact sustainable. This involves high levels of herd mobility over time, facilitated by common property regimes in which property rights are shared amongst groups of users with flexible boundaries. Conventional views on overgrazing and degradation have been challenged by this emerging paradigm in rangeland science. On this polarized and emotionally charged terrain, the temptation is to perceive only, once again, either or options. But scholarship, in fact, offers another view. This is of diverse and multiple ecologies and a range of possible production systems that can be sustained by these ecologies. Systems that vary a great deal in their goals, in their operational logics, and their outcomes. A key example is the notion of carrying capacity of, in this instance, a grazing system. Rangeland science suggests that in any one environment, there's no single appropriate measure of carrying capacity. It all depends on the objectives of the producer. Thus, for example, systems which aim to maximize output per individual animal for single purposes, such as beef or milk or wool, um, will have uh, very different carrying capacities to those that aim at maximum output per hectare, often at much higher stocking rates, often for multiple purposes as do many livestock systems <coughs> on communal rangeland. In wildlife systems, the carrying capacity that is optimal for camera-based tourism will be very different from the capacity needed to optimize meat production from, for example, herds of eland. The fact that producers may have very different objectives means that there are many versions of carrying capacity. And the same applies to Ways in, the, the ways in which we can sustain nature through our production systems. There's not one answer. There are many answers. Okay, so I'm trying to explode these myths that we have these simplistic either-or binary options and suggesting it is, in fact, more complicated. The, the challenge for policy is to decide what to do in the face of this complexity. Let me move to the third aspect, property, property rights. So here we have another binary. On the one hand, private property rights. On the other hand, what uh, my colleagues and I call social forms of property and land tenure. Uh, <clears throat> so these questions of how rights are held is often, are often neglected in the debate around land redistribution. And some uh, advocacy groups, including the EFF, do not really talk about how rights can be secured. The notion of state custodianship is not really in itself an answer. And in fact, this question of how rights can be secured is a key part of the third leg of land reform. Land reform has a redistribution leg, a restitution leg, and a third leg, tenure reform, which has been grossly ne neglected over the past 24 years. It's really the orphan of the land reform program. In relation to the one-third of the South African population who hold, who hold rights within tenure systems derived from customary norms and values, the champions of tradition, such as Contralesa, the Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa, would like control of all land in the former reserves, where one-third of the population lives, as well as all farms acquired through land reform, to be handed over to traditional leaders and to their traditional councils. Another influential body of opinion, 
represented mainly by groups such as the Institute for Race Relations and the Free Market Foundation, argue that private property everywhere is the basis of successful economies, in particular successful capitalist economies, and that therefore they should be the only basis on which redistributed land is held, and in addition should completely replace communal uh, systems of tenure in the former reserves. They advocate large-scale, compulsory, individual titling, systems of private property. Now, there's a third view here, uh, which combines state ownership of land and leasehold rights. In fact, this is found in other African countries like Zambia, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Ethiopia, and it does work reasonably well. Until recently, this hasn't really been considered in the South African case, but it seems to me unlikely that the EFF's notion of state custodianship will gain much support from South Africans, given how widespread the disillusionment with government across the board is. So we have Contralesa, the Free Market Foundation, the EFF, all offering their particular version of a one-size-fits-all solution. This is the ideal form of property right. In this case, not a binary, but a triad. And triads can be dangerous, as we know. In practice, however... If we look at scholarship, property rights can take a wide variety of forms and can be combined in quite a complex manner. Just to take an easy example, sectional title. Here we see private property being combined with provisions for common property managed by a body corporate on behalf of the, 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 the holders of sectional titles. So that's a mixed land tenure system. We should remember also that the 1997 White Paper on Land Policy suggested an important principle that citizens with property rights should be able to choose the tenure system that they prefer from a range of options, perhaps combining components of different tenure options. How, do we, how can we give effect to that principle of choice in policy? That's a challenging question. In my view, <clears throat> we need to rethink our conceptions of land as property. For Okoth Agendo, the, uh, the Kenyan theorist, what is a right? A right signifies a power that society allocates to its members. Where that power amounts to exclusive control, one can talk of ownership of private property. However, it is not essential that power and exclusivity coincide in this manner. Access to this power and its control are distinct. They're distinct aspects of property. Power, access, control. And there are diverse social and cultural rules and vocabularies for defining these terms. In non-Western property regimes, access and control generally do not coincide. And variations in power, that is from in rights, derive primarily from social relations rather than market relations. Control is exercised through members of units of production with different land uses attracting varying degrees of control at different levels of socio-political organization. If you're talking about the land on which a homestead is established, it's generally the family. If we're talking about arable land, the level at which control is exercised is generally the neighborhood, sometimes the ward. If we're talking about grazing land, it's another level of social organization, or if you like, of community. So land rights are embedded in a range of social relationships and units, including households, kinship networks, and various levels of community. The relevant social identities are nested and layered in character. Land rights tend to be inclusive rather than exclusive, as in private property, and include both strong individual and family rights to residential and arable land, as well as access to the commons for a defined group of users. Uh, a group of users. So, I think we can take the South African case as an interesting example. Post-apartheid, given the damage which dominant systems of private property did to the majority of the population, perhaps what we are trying to do is re-embed property within social relations rather than accept the disembedded view which private property tends to accept. And maybe we are trying to create this wider range of options for people. And I think uh, this presents enormous challenges to policymakers. Recently, about 10 months ago, a high-level panel of parliament chaired by former President Khalima Motlante released a powerful and interesting report. One of their key recommendations is that we pass a new Land Records Act which records and registers the rights of people in very different tenure systems, gives them formal recognition without requiring their transformation into systems of individual titled property. 
That is a, a, a well thought through proposal, uh, and I think it's something that we need to take seriously. Perhaps there is an answer to this question, how can policy respond adequately to the complexities we find in society? Okay, what about power? power? Land is clearly a source of power, and power is necessary to control land and territory. Authority and property help to constitute one another, complicating the equation. In South African land reform, the major axes of confrontation and contestation over land tend to be between, on the one hand, government and landowners, or farm owners and farm workers, chiefs versus ordinary people, men versus women, and so on. But those are the four main ones. In all these cases, unequal power in part derives from the way that property rights are configured. And power relations also influence the manner in which property rights are enacted and embodied and become real. These simple binaries, however, the four that I mentioned, can be quite misleading. Let's take the example of communal areas home to a third of the population. Some people here see an irreconcilable contradiction between tradition and custom on the one hand and democracy on the other. In this view, references to custom often suggest a past rendered irrelevant now by a century or more of modernization and now more re recently the advent of democracy with its emphasis on equality, citizen power and downward accountability. In addition... Colonialism and apartheid are often seen as having so fundamentally distorted or corrupted pre-colonial institutions that they now have no place whatsoever in post-apartheid society. The defenders of customary systems, however, see no contradiction. For Contralesa and others, traditional leaders now, as in the past, rule through consultation and consent. They hold land in trust on behalf of their people rather than owning it themselves. They ensure that women are treated with respect and they are accountable to their subjects. In this view, the election of representatives through secret ballots for, uh, in informal democracy is one possible form of democracy, but not the only one, and one that does not necessarily guarantee effective representation in the interests of ordinary people. In the wake of state capture, disillusionment with the formal institutions of democracy is understandable. So, Two contrasting visions of the future are summoned up to support these positions. On the one hand, the inexorable advance of liberal democratic institutions. On the other, the evolution of a hybrid African form of democracy that incorporates the principles of Ubuntu. So, is it a binary once again, or are there other ways of seeing it? Is it more complicated? So here I think we come across an interesting notion, the notion of living law. It sometimes refers to living customary law, but in a wider frame of reference, custom is but one source of law, so living law. Several consti recent constitutional uh, court judgments assert that versions of official customary law found in textbooks and apartheid-era laws are, quote, a poor reflection, if not a distortion, of true customary law, which recognizes and acknowledges the change is continually taking place. That was the bare judgment in 2005. A striking example of this view that custom is itself something which has to adapt and change over time is a recent decision by the Mpunu Traditional Council in Nimsinga, where I do research, to allocate land to single people with children, whether or not they are married, as a response to the marked decline in marriage amongst African people in both urban and rural areas. This is a complete break with custom, saying people need land to live on. These are women, mostly women without children. We need to allocate them land in their own right. This is not something which has been practiced in the past at all. The traditional council in this case is trying to move with the times in response to the demand, the social pressures in society with increasing numbers of young women try accommodated within uh, the homesteads of their parents or their brothers and there's simply not being enough space. So, this might be an example of, of living law. So Aninka Klaasens of UCT argues that struggles over land rights in communal areas are not generally anti-custom in character. Yes, there's resistance to certain corrupt practices like land sales to foreigners, the corrupt agreements between mining companies uh, and certain kinds of traditional leaders. 
and authoritarian rule by traditional council, for example, prohibiting meetings of residents who are opposed to corruption. These are being challenged by rural people themselves, but they're not doing so in order to throw out custom. Rather, these kinds of practices are seen as being in conflict with custom and undermining customary entitlements to land. So this is an affirmation of a particular, a popular version. In fact, it might be seen to be a democratic version of custom. So people do see them as distortions, but they don't render these systems irrelevant. Rather, they are calling for a reinvigorated version in which rights are secured in law and the accountability of leaders downward to community members is required because those people are the rights holders. This is an alternative vision which reconcile the principles, perhaps, of customary norms and values and a modern democracy on the other. So according to Clarsen's, living law interpretations of this kind would open up the determination of the content of custom to the range of people engaged in negotiating, challenging and changing property and power relations in local settings, including women. Power from below, mediating power from above, and complicating the exercise of authority. There's a challenge for policymakers. Right now, as we speak, the traditional Khoisan leadership bill is being pushed through parliament. It gives extraordinary powers, which were never held in the past, to traditional leaders. It gives them control over land. This is a piece of legislation which the high-level panel of, call, of, parli of, uh, of parliament called to be put aside but it is being pushed through. It is something which we should all take notice of and lend support for, us, for stopping it and reconsidering it and, and, offer, and perhaps going with uh, an alternative version, perhaps the living law uh, idea about power property in communal areas. Let me come to institutions. Land reform in South Africa illustrates clearly how the institutions which develop and implement policies and administer land rights at different levels, cannot be understood simply in terms of their formal roles, rules, and functions. However desirable a Viberian-type bureaucracy might be, or the commissions or elected local committees that come into being in land reform uh, context as an ideal, in practice, these institutions are shot through with power relations and are subject to a variety of processes, often at, uh, at odds with the notion of efficiency. At times they are subject to abuse and corruption by unscrupulous opportunists and so-called tenderpreneurs. Common binaries here in this debate around institutions include institutions with integrity versus those that have been captured by private interests, or modern versus traditional, or formal and informal institutions. And some notion of a reinvigorated set of state institutions is implicit in the betrayal of the promise a uh, report launched last year by a range of critical academics and in the recent book, uh, Secret State. So institutions, rebuilding institutional integrity is core to renewing the South African project. But what do we, how do we think about institutions? Uh, in, in our recent uh, research on, on uh, land redistribution in the Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal in the Free State, we are finding massive levels of corruption with regard to the land redistribution program. Well connected business people and officials and politicians uh, are gaining land at the expense of poor people on a, on a large scale. And these findings mirror those in the betrayal of the Promise Report. Uh, so the struggle to clean up the state, now being joined in earnest, is key, and we must all hope for its success. But there are two features of institutions which uh, I think more complicate the story. The one is the discursive and the other is the processual dimension, the processes at work. Firstly, ideas do matter, how we think about things. That's what I'm arguing in general this evening. These ideas matter, as particularly in ret ret routinized bureaucracies where actions are intended to be impersonal, standardized, and transparent. Common sense understandings of the world and how to change it for the better, are articulated in policy and then become embedded in day-to-day -day, day -day routines in a state bureaucracy and at other, in other institutions as well. But if these ideas are flawed, if they are problematic in the first place, it becomes very difficult to change them, no matter how much evidence begins to accumulate of their problematic character. The fact is that the monitoring and evaluation function of government – 
which ideally provides the basis for corrections of policies, is often missing in action. It has been virtually absent from land reform over the past 24 years. And often this ends up in policies having the direct opposite effect to that which is intended, but they continue to be rolled out year after year. So we have to take seriously the ideas at work within in the institutions, which is why the idea of complexity and uh, being able to respond to it adequately is so important. Secondly, the processual dimension. So this, rather than behavior in accordance with formal rules, is often the key to how institutions operate in practice. The quality of an organization's leadership, the kinds of management practices that are engaged in, the emergence of particular institutional cultures, the relationships amongst colleagues are characterized by the trust or mistrust, whether or not error can become the basis for a learning organization rather than one which is simply defeated or in denial. These are often the key issues which create true institutional capacity. And it's not so much a matter of their formal design, but what life we breathe, breathe into these institutions. It's true not only of government, it's true of the local level institutions being set up, for example, in land reform program. Communal property associations or trusts have exactly the same challenges. One of the key reasons for the poor performance of the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform over the past decade has been the shockingly, shockingly poor quality of leadership and management. Policy making by the minister of the time and his team has been whimsical, ad hoc, top down, and a recipe for disaster. So if you have poor processes like that, you're likely to have poor outcomes. So the institutional dimension, while key, is actually more subtle than we might imagine. It's more than simply you know, rebuilding the capacity of the state. It's quite subtle. Finally, let me come to the question of identity. Now, identity politics is at the center of the current policy, uh, debate around land. Land here is a repository of meaning, of dignity, of belonging, and of, me, uh, of, digni of, of meaning. Given our bitter history of frontier wars, conquests, dispossession, settlement and racist policy, land often signifies so much else than simply a productive resource. It is unsurprising that it arouses so much emotion in this highly unequal and divided society of ours, or that reaching consensus on the way forward seems so hard to achieve. Cheryl Walker, an academic at Stellenbosch, offers a, offers a critique, a powerful critique, of the dominant master narrative of land in South Africa, and argues that there's a severe mismatch between the expectations that have stoked the fires of the land question and the actual transformative potential of land reform to address poverty and social alienation. For example, she quotes the maiden speech of the very first Minister of Land Affairs uh, in 1994, Derek Arnicom, who asserted that, quote, the resolution of the land question lies at the heart of our quest for liberation from political oppression, rural poverty, and under underdevelopment. This vision, says Walker, remains compelling at a visceral level, but is actually discontinuous with the practice of land reform on the ground. At the local level, this grand unity fragments, she says, into a kaleidoscope of conflictual projects. More fundamentally, she, she suggests, these conflicts involve much more than the land itself. The master narrative of dispossession has shaped the way that land claims have been presented and received, but its authority quote, derives from the way it blends with, speaks to local meanings that are attached through individual memory to particular pieces of land, entwined with the symbolic imprint of locality on personal narratives of identity and belonging. So identity is a slippery issue, and it's hard to get a handle on. Identity is, in fact, is always multiple, social identities, anyway, of people. All of us belong to many different communities simultaneously, and the boundaries between these communities are often both flexible and highly porous. This complicates the call for the, quote, return of the stolen land and the politics of land reform. For example, in Mthinga, where I work, a person might be at one and the same time female, African, Isizulu speaking, a member of the Amatembu tribe or community, from a family who is dispossessed, as labor tenants, she might be a single mother, a Christian, a teacher, even a member of the DA, and even a believer in private property. It's quite possible. Not an easy mix of social identities, it, is admi it, uh, it must be admitted. 
And this gives the, but this gives the lie to the simplistic binaries which so much of the debate is set uh, is is beset by binaries of black and white, male and female, colonist and uh, victim of dispossession, and so on. So simplified versions of complex realities can be emotionally and intellectually attractive in that they narrow down a problem to a clearly definable issue with a solution just around the corner. But when, they are, uh, when these simple solutions are applied to deeply felt questions of personal or collective identity, oversimplifications can be experienced as deeply affronting. This is one reason why land questions can be so conflictual even when the material interests at stake are relatively insignificant. And when the material, the symbolic, and identity-based dimensions become deeply intertwined, they can become impossibly difficult. Okay, so I do have some thoughts about some general principles which might take us forward, but let me leave those for the time being. And let me rather come to a conclusion. So I've argued that land policies in South Africa have to embrace the challenge of complexity or face certain failure. One image to bear in mind, perhaps, is that of a Rubik's Cube. Six faces of nine blocks, each face a different color, which can be twisted around into something like 40 quintillion different combinations. But they can always be brought back into alignment, if you know how. Douglas Hofstadter wrote some articles in Scientific American a while back, and he revealed there that many people can work for days or weeks or even months on the cube and simply never work out what the solution is. The record time for doing so in the 1980s when he was writing was in fact 22 seconds. It's probably less by now. And some people in, uh, uh, achieve this intuitively. Others by applying complex uh, algorithms worked out by mathematicians, both professional and amateur. He also writes that the cube is a, quote, miniature incarnation of that subtle blend of order and chaos that our world is. Most of the time, you just cannot predict what repercussions even simple actions will have. They simply have too many side effects. One can easily become paralyzed by fear, not wanting to make any move at all, sensing that one can get totally, irretrievably, hopelessly lost. It's end of quote. Sounds a bit like land reform in South Africa, right? But the point is also that when the principles are grasped, one can, in fact, bring the blocks back into perfect symmetry. So there's hope for us yet. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Thanks a lot, Ben. So we have time for a few questions, if there are any. Hi, uh, over here. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say thank you. I come to a lot of science and cocktails, and I can't remember one where somebody dropped this much information this digestibly into a single lecture. This was fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm also going to be that guy and going to ask the question of the times, which is, we currently have a crop that today got dropped, uh, marijuana. We have a new crop. It is currently mostly done by small growers in the Eastern Cape, the Western Cape. You've got a little above Joburg. But how should this actually be approached? Uh, we've got two years now to actually approach the legal question of marijuana. Marijuana growing, uh, how people should actually do this. And this is one of our large crops. We consume a lot. We export a lot. So if you just don't mind going around and telling me about weed, I would be very <laughs> helpful. Thank you very much. Cheers. And I really loved your lecture. I really loved it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, can I respond quickly to that? Look, in Msinga, where I work, uh, uh, it's a, Dacha is a major cash crop. Yes. And it's grown in very small plots for the most part, although around one of the mountains, you can get up on high and you can see these massive hectares under Dacha. It is a very lucrative crop, mainly for women, 
It earns them thousands of rand per year, partly because it's illegal. I mean, the, the middlemen take the bulk of the profit, it must be true, and they pay off the policemen. So people have to take tens of thousands of rands in cash when they're moving Dacha from Msinga to Johannesburg to pay off bribes along the way. But uh, for, to my mind, you know, there's the, 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 the ideals. Look, the people, women are worried. If, you, if they see you approaching their crop to take a photograph, they all run away because they're frightened of being arrested. So there's a certain amount of fear and danger. No, no burnings have taken place over the last 10 years that I've been working there, but there's this constant worry. I think, it pretend, I think the, the, this moment is one in which we should see it as a smallholder crop, and we should create a regulatory environment in which those producers are supported to become the major suppliers to the industry. I think if we, if we go the commercialization route, it's yet another example of privileging the already privileged. This is at the root of our current social crisis. We are not... It's called agricultural policy, right? And I can tell you that the quality of the crop in Msinga is very good. And I'm sure you appreciate that as well. <laughs> Another question. Hi, my name is Yashodan. Land reform is complex, and there are many different solutions to each of these different nuances. But you have to start with, do you have the same shared values? So I think... There is a distinction between people who are progressive and people who are liberal, never mind, never mind those who are conservative, in that liberal people uh, find stability as the thing that they want to drive towards, and, and the progressive people say, well, actually, we need to look at those who are most vulnerable and those who are facing the most pain and address that first. Stability is a secondary consideration. Uh, and uh, another point is... On your talk, you, you only focused on uh, agricultural land reform, yet peri-urban and urban land reform is part of the National Administrative Framework for Land Reform. You don't mention that at all. Uh, the final point is that on the large-scale producers, keeping them there for food security, ownership and management are two separate things. right? So you can have broad-based ownership or worker ownership to a degree, whether it's yeah minority or majority, that doesn't affect the production of the land. That's what I want to say. So uh, your last point is correct, I think. We could have much more uh, employee share ownership schemes. I think uh, one of the prices I would expect the large-scale guys to pay for you know, not going in specifically to take back their land is that they show willing. So it's, it's a quid pro quo. And one of the ways they can show willing is to provide... Uh, real benefits to their own workers. On your second point, yes, I, I just didn't have time to talk about the urban, and it's actually not my own speciality. I work in rural areas. But of course, peri-urban land, land for settlement, land for housing, is critical at the moment. That's where the land occupations are taking place. That's where the EFF is organizing. It's a bit more complicated in the sense that it overlaps with land, with uh, housing policy, and it overlaps with urban spatial planning issues, but it absolutely is central. I'm pleased to see that in Joburg and some other places, we're moving to site and service schemes rather than trying to supply ready-built uh, RDP houses where we're a million, million units behind. But in, uh, I think one of the key lessons that I learned over the last couple of years, beginning to think about the urban question, is to think about the structure of our cities. We have continued to reproduce, reproduce spatial apartheid as in the countryside. We are reproducing these long-established patterns of inequality. The structure of our cities hasn't really altered. When poor people occupy land, it's generally on the periphery, far away from economic opportunities. And people spend a large proportion of their income just 
traveling in order to seek economic opportunity. So I think a key challenge for rural and urban land reform is to address spatial inequality through changing the structure of our economy. And uh, I think the same is true of our transport systems. We've reproduced the old way of doing things. In fact, this are, these are symptoms of a much deeper malaise, in my view. The, the post-apartheid settlement has not really worked out. What the authors of the, the Secret State are arguing, as are many commentators at the moment, is that we need a new economic consensus. We need a new economic framework. We need new policies. Because, frankly, none of the suggestions on offer for how to reduce unemployment in a significant manner are really convincing. What are we going to do? We, we're not competitive in the, global, in, the, in, the, in the global economy. So what are the solutions? These are urgent issues. I can only offer ideas about rural land reform because that's my expertise. But beyond that, these are indeed serious issues. And your first point was... Shared values, well, you I can, think, yeah, yeah, you can, okay. you can discuss strategy only when you have shared values. And if you, if you have a position that says, uh, how do you move forward whilst maintaining stability that I or you benefit from, whilst not taking the primary consideration of actually, no, those who have been without and who have been on the other side of that inequality, uh, that should be the primary consideration. Sure. Look, I think the, the, one of the merits of a robust democracy is that people with very different values and paradigms enter into conversation with each other, sometimes in very robust debates, but it's the process of that engagement which allows us to muddle through and find a solution. I don't think top-down solutions work. I think we've got to, in a messy kind of way, engage with each other, have these difficult conversations and find a way forward. That's why we need to get beyond this expropriation without compensation debate to the question of how we design land reform policies that work, including the question of supporting smallholder farmers. Those are the real kinds of conversations we need. We actually need a, we need a new white paper on land policy, and that takes a minimum of two years to develop and work through. That's what the, uh, the president's expert panel on land, which met today for the first time, needs to be getting on with. Let's get on to the details of policy. And that, you know, so it's creating institutional context in which we can have difficult but real conversations in which we can, uh, we can agree that high levels of inequality are simply not sustainable. Look, the commercial, the commercial farmers, the agri-SAs, are completely on board with land reform. One of them said to me recently, this has been a good debate because it's not even a question amongst our, mem our members anymore. We have to do this for our own survival. So I think we're, we're moving to the point where we can begin to say, let's, let's really begin to attack privilege in a way which actually is sustainable into the future. All right, there's a question this side. Uh, sorry, Ben. Uh. Hi, sorry. So just as a disclaimer, I'm a baby undergraduate student, but I study what it is that is being discussed today. So, yay, thanks. <laughs> I just wanted to know. So first of all, I heard you speaking about redistribution. And personally, I think that there isn't enough discussion around redistribution versus expropriation. I understand redistribution to be what is currently available to X group, which I understand as the state, and then being redistributed amongst the people versus stuff being taken away from other people. So I would like to understand your like views on what, you know, what you think is the best way to go about it. And then that leads into like a value. So personally, I believe that the discussion about land is based on value. I don't think anybody like disagrees with that. Maybe there are, but I think that the discussion around around land is based on this thing has value and we want to know that certain people are accumulating value, certain people aren't and what do you think um, I have my own views but what do you think are ways of creating value and then I understand that you are based mainly in the rural setting so I, I really like that your previous question was around that but in the urban setting especially around space, things with space and um, who it is that is controlling the generation of value or the narrative around value in the urban setting, maybe what some ideas that you have around creating value 
in the long term, in the urban setting, you know, what it might be. Yeah. Good. Uh, look, on, on the redistribution question, I don't think you quite, if I understand you correctly, I don't think you're characterizing it appropriately. The redistribution in South Africa is, let me go back to the Constitution. The Constitution has nine, uh, 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 section 25 of the Constitution is on property. There are nine subsections. The first few sections talk about expropriation under which conditions it, it can take place. It defines land reform as being in the public interest. So expropriation can take place not only for public purposes, such as building schools, hospitals, universities, or whatever, but also in the public interest, including land reform. And it goes on to define the criteria for just and equitable. It doesn't actually define the criteria. It says that compensation must be just and equitable, taking into account the history of the land to be expropriated, the manner in which it was acquired, the degree of state subsidy, the purpose for which the expropriation is taking place, and so on. Towards the, the second half of Section 25, we get Section 25.5, which says the state must take active measures to promote just and equitable access to land and natural resources. There is no legislation at present which gives effect to Section 25.5. By just and equitable, we are really talking about the redistribution of privately owned land from the privileged minority to the majority to create a more just and equitable pattern of ownership. So it's not state resources, it's private resources acquired by the state or with the help of the state and transferred to the disadvantaged majority. The other sections, uh, section 25, 6 and 7, are the rights to tenure security, the right to restitution. There are laws although inadequate in some respect, they are given legislative expression and we are trying to implement them. But Section 25.5 on redistribution, really this should be the central driving thrust of land reform. What's happened is that because redistribution has been slow and so ineffective, lots of rural people are putting all their hopes on a restitution claim. And it's put completely unmanageable uh, expectations onto a program which is supposed to be quick and done with within 10 years. As a result, restitution has become overburdened with large numbers of impossibly complex claims and it is basically in a state of collapse. So we need to redirect our energies to the redistribution program, partly it to allow restitution in its more limited focus to succeed. Redistribution, I think, has to be the name of the game. The high-level panel of Parliament recommended a new redistribution law. In fact, they recommended a national framework law which provides an overarching legislative framework for all the different sub-programs of land reform and gives effect to this redistributive thrust. That's another key priority for policymakers beyond this debate about expropriation. Uh, in terms of value, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Look, there are different views on what value is. Values in the sense of what we what we think is important, or are you talking about economic value? A much more economic value. Okay, so you're talking about what Marx talked about, the law of value, right? So, so that's a complicated question which I could speak for half an hour on, but I, I don't think I should. So let me rather have a conversation with you about value afterwards. Another question up here. Hi, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, I want to just ask about how we work out what people actually want. There's obviously been different studies supposedly done. There's been this long review process going around the country. It's, it's difficult to know how many people really want to farm. As, as an example, we, we don't know how many people just want houses. What, what, in your opinion, is the best way to really understand across the spectrum of rural and urban what people want from re re land reform. Do they want compensation to have a house and have a job in an urban environment, or do they really want to farm? How do we get to the bottom of what different parts of the country and different communities actually really want from land reform? Good. There have been two major studies on the demand for land. One was 1996 and one was 2003 at the HSRC. Both surveys carried out uh, with very large samples found 
um, that demand for land amongst the poor in both urban and rural areas was high. They found, however, that the biggest demand was for relatively small plots of land, less than two hectares, and mainly for growing a little bits of additional food as well as to establish a place to live. There were, of course, demands for larger areas of land, by, but by smaller numbers of people. Um, the, and I think the, the urbanization is a reality. It's happening. So the sharp edge of, of uh, demand for land is in uh, urban and peri-urban settlements as people come to the cities to look for jobs and other kinds of economic opportunities. But um, having said that, I don't think that there is a, a very... Uh, nuanced understanding of, of what the demand for land is. Look, people also, if, so various surveys are carried out in which people ask, are asked, what are your priorities? Um, and it's often said that land comes, you know, nine or ten on the list. What do people want? What are their key priorities? What's most important? Jobs. That's the most important thing. They also want a crime free environment and so on. So it's easy to conclude from those kinds of surveys that there is no real demand for land. I think that would be a mistake. In my view, people on the ground, people who, who, who are carrying, trying to live out their lives as best they can, respond to the reality of what they see around them. If you come and say to them, do you want some land? And they don't see any effective land reform program. They don't see any support for the pe beneficiaries of land reform. For them, it's not going to be a priority because it's not a, a, a real option for them. If there were a real and effective program operating on scale, offering real opportunities, they would probably rate that higher. So I think there's a kind of developmental positivism at work here, which underestimates the subtleties and nuances. Look, in my experience working in different rural areas in the country, I think there is a demand for land. I don't think it's generalized, but I think people who are already trying to produce on a small scale know that they are constrained by the uh, quantity and the quality of that land and the availability of water. But you give people an opportunity and they will expand onto land. There's, to my mind, there's no doubt about that. Of course, the larger numbers of people are going to be in the cities. And as I say, you know, 200 to 250,000 smallholders, that's perhaps a million to a million and a half people at most. So that's a relatively small part of the rural population, which is much larger. It's more like uh, 15 million people. So it's not, land reform can never be the silver bullet to rural poverty. In our country, we're just too constrained. The quality of land isn't good enough. The population is too high. The real solution to poverty in our country has to be jobs in the formal sector. And how, we, how do we create those? That's the $64,000 question, which I wish I could find an answer for. Other questions? <laughs> Hi. So land reform has to happen. No question about it. And I, I loved your talk. My only question is, um, how are we going... There's a pink elephant in the room. How are we going to do this any differently to how our neighbor has done it? How are we going to do it any differently? And, and how are we going to get this right as opposed to how they've done it? Thank you. So I, I was uh, in exile for 19 years, and for part of that period I lived in Zimbabwe from 1983 to 1991. I worked for government uh, in the uh, Agricultural Extension Service, um, and I followed quite closely the Zimbabwean land reform before 19. Uh, 90, until 2000, which was slow but steady, but achieved real results. And I also followed quite closely the post-2000 land reform, so-called land grabs. And in fact, with colleagues from other universities, we conducted a research project in three southern African countries, in South Africa, in Namibia, and Zimbabwe. And our Zimbabwe team uh, has published widely on their findings. They published the first serious book about land reform in Zimbabwe. Um, and the subtitle of their book is Land Reform in Zimbabwe, uh, Contesting the Myths. So what they assert that on the basis of empirical evidence that the media stereotypes of land reform in Zimbabwe are false. Their notion that, that uh, cronies of Zimbabwe are getting the majority of land, that there's no production, no investment, the rural economy is in ruins, 
they provide convincing empirical evidence that none of this is true. It's true to an extent, particularly around Harare, but it's not true in other parts of the country. The ma majority of the beneficiaries of fast-track land reform in Zimbabwe are poor people from communal areas uh, or from uh, small towns, the poor. And most of them are engaged in small-scale farming. The medium-scale farms offered to, to middle-class professionals in urban areas have not done well at all. They've suffered from lack of capital investment. The small-scale farmers, people have invested in them with what resources they can have. And there are some notable successes. Tobacco production by small-scale producers is 95% of what it was when that sector was dominated by large-scale professionals. Of course, there are massive problems. The economy as a whole is in ruins. There's not enough capital to invest. And people have to to go to other countries to work, to send money home. So it's a highly problematic situation. And many of the export-earning crops disappeared with the large-scale commercial farmers. Not tobacco and cotton, but other crops as well. So there's a shortage of foreign exchange in the country. So I would say that land reform in Zimbabwe is a question of a glass half full or a glass half empty. It depends what you want to see. It's not a total disaster. It's not a total success either. What lessons can we learn? We should not do land reform in a way which creates chaos. We should not do land reform in a way which sees human rights abuses. We should not do land reform in a way which see, sees massive disinvestment. But what we can do is redistribute large amounts of productive land to small-scale farmers, and with appropriate support, they could use it very productively, and we could help reduce some of the massive inequality in our country, in particular, the massive inequality in land ownership, which is why we have to do land reform. I think you're absolutely right. Sorry? A phased approach. Yes, let's do this sensibly. Look, we've wasted 24 years. Let's take another decade, at least, but start to do it seriously. And I think what we need to do in South Africa is we need four times the budget. So let's make it 2% of the national budget. For, you know, for an issue which is threatening to destabilize the whole society, surely this is money well spent. 0.4%, it's not serious. And of course, it might not be strictly rational in pure economic terms, but for political purposes, we simply have to do this. And of course, another big problem, I thought I would get some questions on this, is in fact state capacity. The state is very weak. The, the department is in wreck and ruins. We need, we need to spend five years creating the capacity to do that. That's, that doesn't come quickly either. But I don't think we have a choice. We simply have to do it. All right. So maybe time for one last question. Okay. I, okay. Sorry. Hi. Um, I've got a question. So I'll start off because I'm, I'm going to rest sounding very simplistic. So I'm a scientist. I'm also studying complexity science, but I'm going to take this seriously anyway. Um, so you were talking about um, this thing that we have to find um, a nuanced approach. I, I, personally, I think you can never be too, too nuanced, right? Um, you can't really get there. Um, with this redistribution that you were talking about, you were saying something like we have to identify the 5% that is core to the food security of the country, then the remaining guys, we deal with them. You are bound to piss off some people, so we, we have to accept that. So what I need to understand is, let's say I'm Funder Mev and you're saying, dude, you are not part of this core 5%, so we're going to target you. What's stopping me from saying something like, uh, the reason why I'm not part of that 5% is because I didn't have access to the right capital structure, so I'm actually trying, so please don't take it away. I mean, how do you deal with it? He's also pissed. He doesn't want to give away his land. <laughs> Look, you know, the, um, the members of the Transvaal Agricultural Union, which is the more conservative farmers' union, um, are very, very uh, opposed to expropriation of any kind because they want to sell their farms, because they are not making a go of it. These are the less successful, particularly the bottom 50%. They worry they're not going to get a good price for their land. They want to get out. The reason why they still have their land is because the government has been such a poor purchaser of land. They don't know how to do it and they haven't had the money to do it. It's not because it's not on offer. There's plenty of land on offer. And not all, it, not all of it is poor quality land. Okay, some of it is dry. You need, you know, uh, it's extensive grazing. It's only suitable for livestock. But a lot of it is productive land. But the scale of those operations means that it's difficult to be competitive. The big guys are really big. They are huge. They are buying up the farms from these smaller farmers. In the drought, there were 16,000 farms for sale. 
Who's purchased those farms? These are the big guys. I mean, this is capitalism. It's highly concentrated. Every sector in our economy is highly concentrated. And one, in the agricultural sector, what we need to do is provide a wider range of scales and forms of production while moving, I think, in a pragmatic way to, over the longer term to, to change that highly concentrated structure. But in the meantime, there are real opportunities. If we can be pragmatic and not be misled by our idealism or, in fact, by, I think, quite dishonest kinds of populist policies.